Thank you. So my name is Christopher Will, and I'm going to be presenting work, joint work I did with Adi Botea of IBM Research on spatially distributed multi-agent path planning. So before diving into exactly what this is formally, I'm going to try to introduce it by example. So the simplest example and probably the most fun example that I know of is Kiva, where the robots have to navigate around a grid and make sure they don't crash into each other. So we have a bunch of entities moving around a graph with the objective of reaching their final destination without conflicting with one another or crashing into each other. Another example occurs in video games where you have the same basic idea. The units in the video game want to move around a graph, but they're not allowed to occupy the same space at the same time. So they have to make sure that they don't crash into one another. And they have to find paths collectively that get them to where they're going, but don't ever leave them in the same place at the same time. Self-driving cars are a futuristic example where this would be really awesome if we could have it, where the cars would know there's, you know, A, we don't want to crash into each other, but B, we want to get our passengers to the goal as quickly as possible keeping in mind what the other cars are doing. So our car would imagine, you know, avoid traffic for us, which would be really awesome. We actually solve this type of problem ourselves every single day. So when we all came into this room, we all, you know, came from outside, selected a destination, and got to our destination, hopefully without crashing into one another. So this is another example of a multi-agent path planning problem. So now that we have some kind of a high-level sense, intuitive sense of what this might be like, I'm going to try to introduce it more formally. So what we have is a graph, which is just a standard collection of vertices and edges, and a collection of n mobile units, which are the things that are moving around the graph. So these are analogous to the people, the cars, the things in the video game, et cetera. And for each of these mobile units, they need a start and a goal. And the start and the goal are distinct vertices in the graph. So the objective of this problem is to find a path through the graph for each mobile unit that begins at its start vertex, that ends at its end vertex, and at no point in time do two mobile units share a vertex, which would be analogous to two things crashing into one another, which is what we want to avoid. So how difficult is this type of problem? Well, if we have a graph which has v edges and there's a mobile units, the little formula here will describe exactly how many unique configurations of mobile units, that many mobile units on a graph that big there are. So OK, what does that mean in terms of some actual numbers? Well, if we have a grid with 100 vertices and 10 agents, we have more than 6.2 times 10 to the 19th state. So there's a very large number of ways to configure them. And then if we have Pete Werman's Kiva warehouse, a decent sized one with 1,000 robots, 20,000 different places where they can be, I don't even know how to articulate the largeness of this number, where you have 10,000 in the exponent. So the number of states that you have to deal with in these types of problems can be absolutely astronomical extremely quickly. So finding an optimal solution has been proven to be NP-hard, but the good news is finding a suboptimal solution, if you're not too picky, it was shown that that can be done in polynomial time. And one final note on this, in our formulation of the problem, the units cooperate with one another, meaning that they all receive exactly the same reward. So they're not being selfish. Their objective is collectively to get all of them from their start to their goal in as little time as possible. So how is this often accomplished? So most most of the approaches that have been published in the literature rely in some form upon some kind of centralized control, meaning that there is, in some capacity, a central agency that's able to track where each mobile unit is, where the mobile unit is trying to go, where, what the entire map looks like. And the problem that you run into with such an approach is tracking all three of those things long enough to find a solution is computationally intensive. And if you have a big enough problem, it makes it so that you can't actually find a solution using the computational resources available to us. So a lot of uh, approaches will take what we call unit-centric decomposition. So basically, you plan each mobile unit. You give it a path one at a time, which can be done independently. And then there's a couple of different ways of uh, making sure they don't collide. You can treat the previous paths as obstacles. You can and then replan or something like that. So cooperative ASTAR and weighted hierarchical ASTAR are examples of algorithms that take this type of approach. So these approaches work well if the starts and goals are distributed randomly, shotgun throughout the space. So we have randomly distributed goals, randomly distributed starts. These types of approaches work well. The problem is if there's a bottleneck, for example, everyone wants to get to the other side and they all have to go through this middle area here, these bottlenecks can cause problems for that type of approach. 
So just to reiterate, the problems with the unit-centric decomposition are, first, you have to have a centralized control which is able to make sure they don't crash into each other. And this centralized control is going to have to maintain what all the, where, they, where all the mobile units are, what they're doing, and it has to know about the entire map. So our approach relies upon an orthogonal decomposition style, which we call spatial distribution of the computation. So the inspiration here is from air traffic control systems, where the, the, there's one person who's in charge of making sure the airplanes on the ground don't crash into each other. There's another person who makes sure the airplanes that are near the ground, but not on the ground, don't crash into each other. And then that area is a lot larger. And there's another person who's in charge of, you know, like maybe 50 miles around the airport, et cetera. And each of these, each of these different people is handling the traffic within their area in a different manner. And they're also have, and also the other thing is there's about the same number of, aid, of mobile units, like airplanes, inside of each kind of area. So what we do here to solve this kind of problem, what we had here with the bottleneck, is we can divide the map into a number of different kinds of regions. So each region is going to be controlled by its own specific controller. So here we have in the middle, there's a special controller that will do a good job dealing with the bottleneck. And then there's two other regions where there's less traffic. So in the, red, in the red and green regions on this particular map, there's relatively low populations of units and compared to what's going to happen in this bottleneck area. And the existing algorithms work well in that type of setting. But if you look at the white region, every mobile unit is going to have to pass through that region. So you need to do an extremely good job of controlling that region in order to get a decent solution out of this problem. So what this spatially distributed multi-agent pathfinding system does is it takes the entire map and divides it into a number of disjoint regions and then assigns each region on the map its own controller. And the controllers are in charge of everything that goes on in their region and nothing outside of their region. So they, can, so they don't need to know about what's going on in the rest of the map. And then in order to facilitate the transfer of units from one place to the other, the controllers are able to negotiate with one another about the actual transfer of mobile units. So these controllers basically have to be able to perform two functions. The first is can accept mobile units. So the idea here is one of the controllers, they have to be able to answer a question of the form, can I accept a unit at this particular vertex at this particular time going to that destination? And that'll either be something that it's able to do, in which case it'll say yes, or it might be something it's not able to do. Because, for example, perhaps there's already another mobile unit that it has at that location, so the new one would conflict with the existing commitment it made. Assuming that the commitment is actually something that it's able to do, it responds, yes, I can accept the mobile unit, the other thing it needs to be able to do is to be told to accept the mobile unit, which is analogous to saying, all right, I promise I will take this guy at this time, get him through my region onto his next goal, and it's not going to do anything bad. Nothing bad will happen. So we, in, our, in the paper, we focus on two kinds of controllers, a high, what we call high contention controllers, which are in charge of bottleneck type regions, and low contention controllers, which are in charge of regions that are where there's less traffic and there's fewer agents. So just to take a look at this map, if we have a high contention controller for a bottleneck area, the way we approach it was to enforce, simply enforce directional traffic to ensure that the mobile units keep moving quickly and efficiently through the high contention area. This isn't necessarily the optimal policy, but it guaranteed that the mobile units were at least moving as opposed to creating a traffic jam of some sort. So how do we find a high contention area in a map? So the way we did this was with a sliding pattern. So what we did is we have these, we identified a number of patterns which corresponded roughly to a doorway. And these doorways were things we wanted to identify so we could put a high contention controller on them. So the way these patterns work is you look for cells which match the regions of the map which match this pattern. So it would be empty cells are white, not um, blocked cells are black, and these striped cells can either be blocked or not blocked. So if we take a look at this pattern, this pattern would match this area over here. So once we've identified an area that looks like it would be a good spot for a high contention controller, we then build a little buffer around it so that the units can stack up and wait in case there's too much demand to go through the queue at one, at one time. And then we establish how do the agents are going to move through the area. We, point, we figure out which side of the controller is going to be moving in which direction and we figure out how they will move through the buffers. And then the good news is once we've done this, planning in the high contention areas, which is originally one of the most difficult parts of the problem, now actually becomes the easiest part of the problem because there's three simple rules. It's 
If you can get into the next region, do that. If, there's, if you can't get into the next region, just go deeper into the controllers. Like if you're over here, go over here or over there. And if there's something in front of you, there's another mobile unit, just wait. In the low contention areas, we used cooperative ASTAR, which isn't necessarily the, it isn't the, the great latest and greatest multi-agent path planning problem. But we found that within the confines of our wide open rooms, it was a good choice of algorithm. So what this, the way this algorithm works, just kind of at a high level, is the previous mobile unit's paths are treated as obstacles in space and time. And then the other thing we had to do is the goal. We had to figure out the, the goal is to get it not to a specific cell, but to the next region. So the goal had to be expanded a little bit in terms of, in terms of the cell. So any cell that gets it to the next controller is a good enough goal. But we can use any kind of algorithm that's able to implement that interface with the two questions, the can I accept this and get told to accept it. So the way this entire algorithm works is the mobile units will identify a high level path through the different regions of the graph. So if, if we had a mobile unit that wanted to go from here to here, it would figure out, the, it needs to start out in this room, go through this doorway, which is set, controlled by its own controller. Then it would need to move through this long room. It would need to move through this little doorway here and then into this room. So then the first thing it does, it contacts the first controller on its path and says, I'd like a path that gets me from where I currently am to where the next, either the, its final destination or its next, the next controller, in the re next controller on its path. And it executes that path until it reaches the next controller, at which point then it asks for the next segment of its path. And it repeats this until, they've gotten, until it's gotten to this goal. So now for a quick empirical evaluation of how well this kind of approach works, we compared against two other uh, multi-agent path planning algorithms, MAP and Parallel Push and Swap. They were both implemented in C++. We used the original author's code. Our algorithm is implemented in Java. We used 27 maps from the Dragon Age Origins game published by Nathan Sturdivant. So how do well did this work in terms of runtime? So what we have is SDP, which is our algorithm, is the one in blue. And map is in red. And parallel push and swap is in pink. So if we look at the, uh, the runtime, what we can see is the new algorithm is a little bit slower, but only on the very easy maps. If we look at the most difficult maps, the, keep in mind the time is on a log scale here. So on the most difficult maps, the ones which take more than 10, more than like one second or so, the speed up is pretty substantial. It's almost an order of magnitude for the most difficult problems. Now, it gets beaten by about an order of magnitude, but only on the least difficult problems. So if your objective is to reliably, robustly find solutions quickly, this is a very good approach. So how about the make span? So the make span is just how long did the, the, the unit that had to wait the longest to get to its goal, how long did that take? So we can see a similar pattern here where the mobile unit, where the, the make span, it's comparable for the, for the less difficult problems. But as the problems get more difficult, the algorithm, the, the spatial distribution approach does much better compared to other approaches. Again, but as the, only as the problems get more and more difficult. So we can see the same trend, which is this approach works very well when the problems are very difficult. And it, provide, it performs decently when the problems are less difficult, but not as good as the existing algorithms. So just to wrap up, I want to go over a couple areas for future work. We believe that better bottleneck detectors, which are more robustly able to detect doorways, is a huge area for improvement on this. Because our little corridor detectors are very good for detecting grid-based corridors that are align nicely in a row with the grid. If, the, if there was, for example, a crooked doorway, it wouldn't be able to notice that type of thing. But the same type of approach, if we had a detector that, that found that type of thing, would work really well. Another area for future work is more opportunistic high contention controllers. So our high contention controllers, they simply route traffic always up or always down, depending on which side of the, which side of the road you happen to be on, basically. But if there's a huge amount of demand for traffic in one direction, Switching the direction of the opposite road would be a great way to increase flow. And as long as that you know, doesn't starve the guys on the other side, that would be an excellent way to imp improve the throughput of the algorithm. And last, alternative low contention controllers are another huge area for improvement. So we used a cooperative ASTAR, which it's known that that algorithm is, you know, there's, there's been a number of algorithms that have superseded it in terms of performance. So 
if we were to mod if we were to figure out how to modify something like map or a parallel push and swap for use with our uh, interface, then we could put it into the low contention regions, and we believe that's a substantial area for improvement as well. So just to wrap up, one of the nice thing the nice things about the spatially distributed approach is it allows you to use simpler controllers, and they're simpler because they're dealing with a smaller area of the map. They're only in charge of little areas, so they can. You know, everyone knows that finding a mega path is a lot harder than finding a short path. So by, by having the map split up, the path planning becomes less difficult, and it, which allows you to improve the computational efficiency within of, of your algorithm. And also, it's completely orthogonal to many of the unit-centric decomposition approaches that are currently dominating the literature right now. So we can take the spatial distribution approach and apply it in addition to a unit-centric decomposition approach. Thank you. So you mentioned make span, but uh, how well does this do to minimize the average wait time for any individual unit? So it works. It make span. It works fairly well. I mean, they, like if you were to just do um, the sum of all travel times and don't include the wait, like waiting at your goal as charged to your um, your account or something like that, it looks basically the same as make span in terms of you know, the way the plot looks. Uh, your algorithm can work uh, even if there are uh, multiple doorways from uh, one region to another, or you always assume just one doorway between the regions. So if there's more than one door, if there's more than essentially more than one high-level path, the way the algorithm currently works is it you know you it ha you, you pick one. But if, for example, one route was more congested than the other, and the algorithm had the ability to detect that, there's no there's no reason that it has to pick the you know commit to one high level path and then actually you know commit to executing it for real. It could, for example, say, uh oh, this this particular doorway I'm trying to get through looks like it's going to be really congested, so maybe I should reconsider the high level path. So if the if the high level path generator had some way of interacting with the controllers and asking, you know. Are you busy? Are you less busy? That would, I think, also be an area where you could extract considerable performance out of by basically making the agents do a good job of allocating themselves among the, the different areas. OK, thanks again. We'll continue at 2.